Welcome everyone. Uh, the last lecture is a uh, <coughs> event uh, that was originally designed by Randy Pausch, um, who, upon hearing his terminal cancer diagnosis, decided to have one last lecture talking about the thing that he wanted to pass on to students the most. Um, we have turned this into a bit of a tradition. And uh, today our speaker is Paolo Santori, who will be speaking on leadership. And it's rather annoying uh, perseverance in popular culture and academia. Um, I hope you all enjoy. Um, at the end, we will be having some drinks uh, here near in the uh, <coughs> uh, Esplanade building and, uh, well, have a lot of fun. Okay, so thank you very much to Studium Generale and Extramuron and Extramuros and uh, Ruben and Annalike for inviting me. So, my last lecture, I mean, when Ruben one month ago asked me, oh, uh, we have this tradition of the, the last lecture, the first question that I asked myself was, what I'm going to talk about? I mean, because, I mean, usually when you give a, a last lecture, you are supposed to look behind, you know, your long career as an academic, as a researcher. But I joined Tilbury University two years ago. So, I mean, that, <laughs> that option was, uh, you know, <laughs> already cancelled, I mean, for me, you know, some wisdom from my long academic career. And so what do you do? Uh, I ask advice. I ask to my parents, to my parents, to my friends, to my girlfriend, what should I talk about? And my girlfriend and my friends told me, oh, make it personal. Don't be too abstract as you usually do in the, in the normal lectures. And that was a pretty good advice. Then I called my parents and uh, my mom, I remember, picked up the phone and I said, oh, I, Mom, I was asked to give the last lecture at Tilbury University. She was like, oh, I knew it. You have been fired. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, thank you for that. I, I knew it. I mean, like, I mean, so, that's like, and then I explained, oh, it's a lecture as if it was my last. And she said, cool, but, but don't get fired. <laughs> so immediately. And then I said, okay, maybe I am a philosopher. I teach philosophy and business ethics and various things. So I can look back at the history of philosophy, specifically history of Western philosophy, and it came to my mind uh, Aristotle, uh, the famous book, the Nicomachean Ethics, right, in which Aristotle gave, uh, uh, wrote one of the most influential books on ethics in, uh, in the history of Western philosophy, and uh, who was Nicomachus? As you know, Nicomachus was Aristotle's son, so the Nicomachean Ethics is uh, a book that a father wrote to a son full of advices on how to live an happy life. And for Aristotle, you know, happiness is not something that happened, but it's something that you need to, to cultivate. It's about fulfillment, flourishing. And so this seemed like a pretty good topic. I can do something like Aristotle. Problem is that I'm not a father, not yet, and I'm not Aristotle. So, I mean, all that was uh, cancelled. And then it came to my mind this quote. Now, look, I am really against extrapolating quotes out of context, but sometimes you can. And I remember that I read somewhere this quote by Martin Luther King, by the way, this year is the 60 from the famous speech, I have a dream, in which Martin Luther King said, even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. Beautiful, beautiful. I can end the last lecture now, you know, because this is, a quote that captures a lot of things, but how I interpret it, the thing there is to say, look, don't, even if this is your last day on earth, do not try to finish what you have already started, or don't try to still uh, uh, perfectionate what is your best product, but start something new, plant an apple tree. So what I'm going to talk about today is my ongoing research on leadership and leadership studies. That is the research that I started, I mean, I think one year ago, so it's still an ongoing process. But because my point is that the last lecture is not me giving you my wisdom so that you go away with this gift, you know, made by me, you know, of Paolo's wisdom, uh, you know, something. The idea, how I interpret Martin Luther King is, uh, this quote is, it's more important to initiate process, even if it's your last day or your last lecture, than occupying spaces. 
So this is why today I'm gonna talk about something that I'm not entirely sure about, even if I did some research upon. And, uh, and I really hope that during the discussion, uh, uh, maybe you can have some concerns, questions, doubts, you know, some, not to put pressure on you, right? But just to say that this is a collective endeavor. And then the title. I gave the title of my last lecture, The 25th Hour. I don't know if you have ever watched the movie, The 25th Hour, or read uh, the novel on which the movie is based. It's, uh, it's the story of this man uh, that uh, is uh, convicted with a sentence for seven years, and uh, he received uh, the notice, uh, the notification of his conviction one day before he actually needs to present to jail and start the seven years. So the 25th hour is the idea that you have one hour more before the day ends. And what really impressed me about this novel and movie is that, of course, in this day, he looked back at his story, the mistakes he made, the choices he made that brought them brought him there, but what, the, what really is interesting is that he spent the last day going to the people that he knew, that are part of his history, his uh, girlfriend, his brother, and what I understood is that the 25th hour is not, it was not for him, it was for them. So my point here is to say that this lecture, I mean, of course, I'm giving it to you, and uh, it's something that has to do with my life as my girlfriend and friend suggested, but it's still something that is really related to you. And then there is something more. I like also this image of the 25th hour in the sense that it's, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, at the, the movie, he still goes to jail. Nothing changes for him. And uh, I mean, the 25th hour is also the idea that something is going on that is too late for changing but that still we are given a bit of an additional time to try at least to be aware and make something about it. And here we come to the topic of my, of my lecture, which is about leader and leadership theories. I have no, I've noticed, and I'm not alone in this, a worrisome tendency in a contemporary Western society. And is uh, the tendency about this overemphasis on the role of leaders and leadership theories. Now, you need to know that in the last two years, uh, I have been in a um, long distance relationship. So my girlfriend, she's Portuguese, so I travel back and forth from here to Porto, but also my family, I'm Italian. I don't know if you guessed it, but anyway. Uh, and so, I mean, I traveled a lot. Now, leaving aside the environmental impact on that and the fact that I'm totally scared of flying, but this is not relevant, I had the chance many times to go to the airports. And do you know that those kiosk where you in the airport see a lot of books and newspapers. Th those are one of my favorite places in the world because there, just having a look at the newspapers and at the titles of books, you get an impression of where the world is going or where a part of society is going. And now I put in picture what, what I found. So these are not the books that I actually see there, but I mean, a good representation. So first, how to be a good leader winning techniques and secrets to exceptional leadership. Leader as healer, you know, the world needs every leader to read this book and need his words. And then how to be a good boss and a leader. So team building, time management and communication skills for effective leadership in the workplace. Okay, I said, people are interested in leadership, that's fine, but, but this is not over. All the last lecture is me showing you titles of these books. Start with why, how great leaders inspire everyone to action. The inspirational leader, inspire your team to believe in the impossible. How to be a leader of Plutarch, an ancient guide to wise leadership. How to be an effective leader that you hold here, right, the, the power. Develop leadership skills and build effective teams. How to be a better leader, you know, kind of, or the future leader, like with the lighthouse. So now, this is not a moment of uh, book shaming like me, because these are, these are uh, of course, uh, books that are the, the, the result of some researches, and probably I, I didn't read them all, but there are many interesting things in them. But then, in parallel, there is also a lot of publication, more scientific, more coming from academia on leadership theories. So again, self-leadership, the art of becoming a leader, international bestseller. Self-leadership, the servile leader, 
how to build a creative team, develop great morale and improve bottom line performance. Tribal leadership, leveraging natural groups to build a thriving organization. Moral leadership, the theory and practice of power, judgment and policy. Quiet leadership, six steps to transform performance at work. Lives of morals leadership, leading gracefully, a woman guide to confident, authentic and effective leadership. The leadership star, because you need the star, right? I mean, a, a practical guide to build engagement. Lead like a woman, gain confidence, navigate obstacles, empower others. Boundless leadership, boundless, I mean, no, no limits. The servant, a simple story about the true essence of leadership. Compassionate leadership, because you have also that. Ethical leadership and ethical leadership again. Again, this is not a moment, I mean, I could have continued really for 45 minutes with this. So, so I, I picture myself with, the, with this huge library when all these book of leadership are falling on me, right? I mean, and what I noticed, what is my first claim? I saw a correlation between the number, the really growing number of this publication and the courses that inside academia, also here and outside, are about, uh, are given, are offered on how to become a leader. So you, you go in various business schools, but you go also in a civil society, in spiritual organization, whatever. There are a spread, there is a spread of courses on leadership that, that you really cannot imagine. And of course, this is correlation that, as you know, is not causation. I'm not saying that one element caused the other. It's not that we have more books because we have more courses or the other way around. But together, these two things signal a tendency, something that, that is happening. And also, I don't know if you noticed, many of these uh, books of leadership are not about leadership in politics, but mostly in organization and in business. Okay, so it's there that this, uh, this thing is, is growing. And then I said to myself, maybe there is a huge demand, right, for leaders in all spheres of human and of human life. We need more leader and we need to form this leader, to educate pe people uh, to be, to be leader. Uh, now, what is, uh, sorry, what is the idea, but what is the kind of leadership that a bit is behind all these uh, recent and very growing uh, stream of literature? Well, the idea comes from the German sociologist Max Weber, and it's the idea of the charismatic leadership. Who is for Weber a charismatic leader? A certain charisma is a certain quality of an individual personality by virtue of which he is set apart from ordinary men and treated as endowed with super, supernatural, superhuman, or at least specifically exceptional powers or qualities. These are such as are not accessible to the ordinary person, but are regarded as of divine origin or as exemplary. And on the basis of them, the individual is concerned and is treated as a leader. I think that this idea of charismatic leadership, and there are also books about charismatic leadership, but I didn't show it. All those books that we saw, both in leadership theories and in this book about self-development, how you can be a better leader, are more or less based on this uh, intuition by Weber. Weber didn't give any uh, qualitative judgment on this. He was not saying uh, it's good or bad because he was a sociologist. But what I noticed, is that this model of leadership today is spreading and is very popular in business. Uh, business people really like this uh, idea of charismatic leadership. Uh, what is the idea of charismatic leadership? That the leader should uh, elicit the actions of the followers. So if you are a leader, if I am your leader, you should, be, you should want to, 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 to follow me. I should not force you to follow me, okay? And the idea is that uh, these new forms of leadership overcome another form of leadership of the past century, still in business, in which leadership, the charismatic leadership, is given by the hierarchy. You know? So do, do you know this uh, last century big firms or corporation where there is a precise hierarchy and structure, and so there is the, at the top you know, the, the owner of the, the board, the, and then there are all the employees until the last wheel of the chariot. Um, this form of leadership uh, somehow is, uh, go, is not working anymore. 
the, the idea what people in business, especially and in organization, understood is that it's better to have uh, uh, leaders that are charismatic in some way can elicit the action of the followers, give the followers the impression of freedom, that they are in charge. So <laughs> this is a, a, a picture from an Italian movie. It's called uh, Fantozzi, it's a tragicomic movie. And it's about capitalism in uh, Italy in the 60s and 70s, where you had this huge corporation, like La Mega Ditta, the mega corporation, uh, kind of a Mordor thing, like with the, with the head, the mega galactic director that is at the top, like, you know, the eyes of Sauron. And this is a leader. And when uh, Fantozio is an accountant, this character meets th this leader, uh, it's, uh, again, tragicomic, is like bowing to him because it's, this leader, th the, the person who is at the top, is kind of like a saint, you know, is there like praying, you know, asking for his uh, advice. And also, it's funny when uh, the leader passes, all the employees uh, scream, he's a beautiful uh, leader, he's a, he's a saint, he's an apostle, right? I mean, very enthusiastic. But what this makes you see, in short, is that there, the qualities of the leader were given by the hierarchy. In the way in which the firms and the corporation were structured, mostly in the last century, is the hierarchy that gives the leader the quality that he has, or she has, or they have. What is now my claim, and sorry for the long quote, you know, but uh, this uh, research that I'm presenting is based on a research that I did with another person, and I show you in the end that this is relevant. And what we claim in this paper is that, and I read it, the culture of postmodernity creates post-patriarchal young people who are less used to and less prepared for the virtues of obedience from superiors, but more sensitive to the values of freedom, equality, consent and contract. And this is how the leader figure is born, the contemporary leader is born. One that does not need hierarchy to make the organization work because the consensus and the adhesion from, of the collaborators arise from the leader charisma, their ability to convince, their persuasion and authority, or in the most recent form, compassionate servant, all this kind of thing, from their moral values and communicative skills. Leadership appears to be postmodern, egalitarian, gentle, liberal, non-hierarchical, and even fraternal than the old organizational theories of the 20th century, and also certainly more ethical and respectful of everyone's dignity. So my judgment, our judgment of this new leadership form is not immediately negative, okay? They are maybe better than that hierarchical model in which, you know, the, 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 the workers needs to follow the command of the, of the employer, of the boss, you know. But there is a problem. And what is the problem? That, yes? Yeah, there is some interference. Oh. Maybe I stay away from the, the slide. No, that's okay. I can, sorry that now I'm in front of the, it is what it is. So, um, what can be a uh, uh, um, possible explanation of this uh, uh, changing in the nature of capitalism and uh, the, the way of which corporations are structured? Well, there are many, but one that is very interesting comes from this book. I don't know if you ever read it, The New Spirit of Capitalism by two French sociologists, Boltaski and Chiapello. What they say in this uh, uh, book, or how I summarize it, is that capitalism is calam, cala, camal, <laughs> I don't know how to say it, is like a chameleon, and transform itself, feeding on everything it finds in its path, like an empire, conquering the animal, peoples, and incorporating their culture and religion. So they claim that capitalism and the, especially the structure of corporation changed because uh, in the last uh, decades of uh, the last century, there were some critiques coming from civil society and academia, from workers, from more socialist critique, but also from intellectual and artists. And somehow capitalism embedded these critiques and transformed and adapted itself. What was the critique of the 68th generation of the intellectual? that those hierarchical forms, th th that kind of job that is repetitive in which you have a, a boss and you need to comply with the boss and its, his or her orders, 
is something that we don't like anymore. So we need something else. And according to, men, to them, it, this is why today we have uh, also big corporations that are more built upon single teams. They are more agile, more fluid, five, six people, you know, with, uh, so, so they, they, they look like less hierarchical, less uh, uh, vertical, you know, more, more horizontal and egalitarian. And of course, leadership fits very well with this. All these new normative leadership theories, uh, you can understand them in this narration that I'm giving now, that I'm furnishing. So this uh, ethical leadership, moral leadership, charismatic leadership, servant leadership, distributed leadership, transformational leadership, spiritual leadership, contemplative leadership, inclusive leadership, responsible leadership, and of course, Aristotelian leadership and Kantian leadership, right? I mean, it always to be Kant somewhere. So what, what is my claim here is that these theories are not descriptive. They are not telling you how the leaders naturally perform, but how the leader has to perform. So it's, they make a claim, they say, look, in these uh, courses uh, within and without academia, when you educate the people to become leader, you need to educate them to acquire a certain charisma that can still elicit uh, the response from the followers, but still has also some moral or ethical or more inclusive elements. And again, nothing wrong. This is, I'm not saying that this is our bad research or something that we should ignore. But <laughs> there is a problem that today no one wants to be Robin. What does it mean? It means that this uh, uh, wave of leadership studies and leadership courses coming especially, I think, from the world of business and invading all the spheres of society they make the role of Batman, of the superhero, very salient, very visible. W when I was young, there was this cartoon of Batman, and uh, I remember that there was the, the soundtrack that uh, I wanted to sing, but then I, I sang to my girlfriend, she said, it's better not, I mean, don't, don't do it, so because he's in Italian, okay, I will not. But, uh, but, but I remember exactly the words, Batman was the smartest, the strongest, the most just, he fought with uh, ability, charisma, all these kind of things. So for me, when I think about leaders, I think about my personal experience, about Batman. But in that, uh, in that cartoon, there is also Robin. I mean, there is also someone who helps the leader. And here, Robin means the groups. In organization, uh, there is a leader and there are groups that are led by this leader. Now, the big emphasis even in good faith on these new ethical, the new leadership theories, put the accent, make very visible the leader, the single person at the center of the stage and shadow the role of the groups. And this is what we claim in this uh, article. The problem uh, with leadership is not, the, is not the, that you put an adjective, a new adjective, ethical, moral, servant, inclusive, compassionate, silent, quiet, I can continue. The problem is the noun. There are some problems with leadership theories. And uh, I'm not, we were not, and we are not the first to have discovered those. But now I will uh, list some. For example, the fact that leaders, you do not create leaders. You do not educate leaders. As you know, leaders emerge from situations. You see this most of the time in politics, but also you see in real life, you cannot by definition educate someone to be a good, a good leader and to show those qualities that this person needs to have to be a good leader. But this is not something that I argue. There are thousands of books about it. And also remaining with Weber, that charisma, that incredible qualities that this leader has, uh, they are not acquired or uh, you, you cannot educate. This is something that you receive. Weber had in mind the charisma like the God's grace that makes some prophets the leaders. Or maybe you can think about natural abilities, natural skills that make you that incredible person that become a leader. But all of this is already in the literature. What is our contribution? And now I think it gets interesting after 27 minutes that I speak, but that's okay. I mean. New leadership theories, so the moral, ethical, 
all those, hide in good faith the issue of control. When you read uh, the papers and the books, as I did, of these new leadership theories, you think that in the end, uh, the leader is really a servant of the follower and the follower are in charge. But this is not the case. The leadership theories, by definition, distinguish one person, the leader, and a group, the followers. And the leader lead and the followers follow. And I'll show you this through an example with politics. Another problem, new leadership theories, they are normative. They are not describing human beings as they are, but as they should be. In doing this description, they downsize the recognition admiration motive in leaders and overemphasize their pro-social and moral motives. I will explain it. And then also, and this is the big really worry that I have, something that I really care about, it is personal, that the, these new leadership theories shadow the role of groups and cooperation. The emphasis is on the, on the leader and the group is secondary. And today, this wave is bringing us all, especially I think young generation, but not just young generation, in a world in which we want all to be Batman because we think that Batman, the leader has some qualities that make that person better. It's better to be a leader than a follower. And then, of course, as I am not a philosopher who just criticizes, because it, sometimes it's easy to criticize, like, you know, doing philosophy with the hammer, yeah, right? Now I did article shaming, book shaming, and say that they are all wrong. I group them all together, being totally unfair to them. But that, I, we, Bruni and I, I have a proposal for the 25th hour. So I'm not going to end saying, oh, it's too late, this is already happening, we don't have alternative. I have my own normative idea on how it should be uh, this issue of leadership in organization. So now, in the 15 minutes that I have left, and for, for sure I will take 20, 20, but that's okay. Let's move to the control issue. And I will explain this, contrasting how leadership is in politics and how leadership is in organization. Now, get ready, because I'm about to introduce what we do in this paper. We adopt the rational choice theory. Something that when I said to my colleagues in philosophy, they say, no, rational choice theory, no. I mean, it's, we know that is wrong, right? This idea that people are rational insofar as they pursue their goal, that we are all self-interested. So we are, we not only are self-interested, but we always try to maximize our own utility, our own goals. So we are perfectly rational, perfectly always focused on what we want to achieve. And second, this idea that is popular in rational choice theory that you can divide in many social contexts, the people in principal and agent. Who is the principal? The principal is the person who has authority, who has the power, who has the control. The agent is a person that the principal delegates for pursuing the goal of the principal. So, now it's, it might sound abstract, before uh, uh, showing you what th this theory is about and how it makes sense, let me say that, of course, in this paper, we know that people are not really like this. We are not rational machine uh, maximizing our own utility. But there is a difference, I think, when you endorse a theory and you think that that theory is saying something true about reality in toto, and when you use a theory to highlight a problem that you spotted. And this is what we are doing here. Following this reasoning, tomorrow you are going to vote, many of you, right? There are the elections, correct? So how can you read politics through the principal agent moment and rational choice? You have the principles and the agent. Citizens are the principal. In democracy, you might find this strange, but we are in charge, the people, people who vote. And the agent, the politician, is that person we, that, who we elect to pursue the goal that we think are important. Okay, so you can read uh, what you are going to do tomorrow through these lenses in representative democracy, there is a kind of a contract between citizens and politicians. Now, in the previous slide, in the second point, I said something. I said, look, what rational choice theory understood is that sometimes the goals of the principal can be different from the goals of the agent. Sometimes the agent can have uh, 
their own goal that they want to pursue can happen. So how do you control in politics the people you elect? Well, the fact that elections are recurrent is a way, correct? So if you elect a politician who promised you something, promise you to advance the goals that you think are important, that person then, once they start to promote their own goal, then you, the next election, stop voting to him, for him, her, or them. But also, of course, that politician that we elect in representative democracy has no absolute power. If something happens beyond constitutional limits, I mean, there are some mechanism of check. But there is also leadership. What is leadership here? What makes an agent a leader? In politics, I'm reading, the leader is an agent who shows attributes of knowledge, talents, skills, virtues and merits that made them suitable to pursue goals set by the principal. What does it mean? That when you vote for a person who you think is a person that inspires you, that you trust, right? Because it, this person has some qualities, you maybe value that person for those qualities. But according to rational choice theories, those qualities that the leaders exhibit are also a way for the principal to control the agent. They help you in controlling. Why? Because if this person is not simulating and has really this characteristic that you think are good, that it might be true that when this person got elected will advance the goals for which you elected them. That is the idea, in, to say it better. Those qualities are useful for the citizen principal to control that the agent politicians will pursue the principal goals without diverting from it. So in this example, in party, who is the leader? The agent. The agent is the leader, okay? The one that who has to show these extraordinary qualities, the charisma. Uh, but this is the problem uh, when we come to organizational leadership is that here is the other way around. In organization, think about a business. Uh, the principals are the owners and the managers. Who has the power? Who controls? Are them. And who is the agent? The workers or the people of the group, the followers. And what happens here? That the, these new leaders, the charismatic, the ethical, the servant, uh, but, but I, I read many, the docile, the uh, spiritual leader, I mean, all these kind of new leaders, they present themselves as caring specific attributes. They want to be freely recognized and followed by the employee followers. But, the, and here what seems is that the locus of control, who is in charge, are the followers. Because when you put all these, these adjectives on the leaders, that the leaders need to care about the group, the good of the group, inspire the group, uh, care about it, each single individual in the group, you say, oh, so this leader is a really a servant of this group, and his or her or them characteristic of leadership are something that are for the good of the group. But this is not the case. In organization, Leadership is probably the most important thing of this lecture. It's, the, it's not a tool to ensure that the manager will carry on at or at least acknowledge employees' goals, but rather that the employees will carry on the goal of the manager leader without incurring the problems of hierarchical or authoritarian leadership. That is the issue. That, of course, there is no any more hierarchy. So you freely recognize someone as your leader. But in the end, who set the goals? Is the leader, are not the followers. So it's, it's the other way around. Here, the follower is the agent, and the leader is the prince. It's the other way around of what that should happen in politics. So you see the, the point. These new forms of leadership, they present themselves as something to overcome hierarchy, to overcome uh, power, but in reality, and to, va to value the freedom of the followers. Uh, the follower freely choose to follow the leader, but in reality, the issue of control, the person who is in charge, are not the followers, are the leaders. So, in, in a sense, this, to me, seems even more pervasive, uh, like a more horizontal 
control, you know, on the actions of the person who are following you, if you are a leader. So this is the first problem, the issue of control. In organizational leadership, in the new forms of leadership, the emphasis of the moral qualities or attributes of the leader sh overshadow the issue of control. It seems that the followers are in charge, but this is not true. Because the leader is in charge, the leader set the, group of the, the goal of the group. And then we move to the fourth point, recognition and admiration. What is here the idea? That if you read uh, those papers or book that I put there, you get the impression that this leader is really a saint. Someone who is uh, really disinterested, always caring for the group, the good of the group, or helps the group to achieve a collective goal. So the leader become someone who becomes someone who is endorsed with very big moral qualities, like, like as if he's someone who is there to serve the group, is there for the followers. But these, even if I understand that these are normative theories that they tell us how leaders should be and not as they are, at this point, forget something very important, that people like to be in position of leadership. You like to be imposed, and even uh, the most one of the most absurd theory, the rational choice theory, recognize this. They call it rational deference. L let me read, and then I explain. Some individuals may supply deference to those whom they consider the more informed, but at the same time, those who purport to be relatively better informed demand deference in the sense that they place a positive value on having other influenced by their opinions and findings. For such people, for these leaders, the potentiality that others might be intellectual followers is positive, positively valued, either in and by itself or instrumentally. Why instrumentally? Because if I am a leader, you are my follower, the fact that you recognize me as a leader and you admire me helps me to direct better your actions toward the goal that I decided, not you. Maybe that goal is also good for you, I'm not excluding that, that case. But the point is that not only it's good instrumentally, but also I like to be a leader. I like to be recognized as a leader. You don't need rational choice theory. You know that people seek recognition and admiration. You know that it is a, now I don't want to be an essentialist, like say that there is a human nature with these traits, but for sure it's a common characteristics of people that they like to be seen and admired. And these leaders are seen and admired by their followers for those exceptional qualities. And this is, is a problem because if you, again, put a lot of value and stress on the role of the leader, on these qualities that makes this person servant, compassionate, uh, ethical, moral, and all this kind of stuff, and then you overshadow that, that we are human beings and we like, we have also this tendency of <laughs> really like to be admired, okay? And this is a problem, for me it's a problem because again, read all those papers that I put, no one acknowledged this, right? The, just how the leader should be. And then the fifth point, and I'm going quickly to the conclusion, it's not true, but I say just uh, leaders, it's true that leaders provide a service for the group. The leader, in the end, uh, helps the group of followers to achieve something. So the leader can foster coordination and cooperation that is necessary for reaching a group goal. So in this sense, it's better to have a leader than a hierarchy, especially if what I said is true, that today, new generation, but also my generation, react not very bad to hierarchy or vertical relations and very good to horizontal relation. I mean, it's good that you have a leader that somehow is admired, is recognized as someone who is caring for the group and helping the group to get where the group needs to go. But what is the problem? Here I present you the only adjective that I like attached to leadership, romanticized leadership. This group of authors, did something very interesting. They show that groups tend to overemphasize the role of leaders in reaching group goals. There is a narrative bias, meaning that the big and due emphasis on the role of leaders in achieving group goals 
affect followers' perception and evaluation of specific scenario. If the role of Batman is so full of all these characteristics, of all these uh, you know, qualities uh, that, that we attribute to him, I mean, then the role of Robin is ignored, is a downside. But for in each episode, if you watched Batman, Robin is necessary. I mean, Batman alone uh, always fail or always get in danger, you know? but also real life, not, not really real life. If you have ever been in an organization, whatever kind of organization, where there is a group of people, you know that is not the leader that is the one that is decisive to arrive to a common goal. Each role is important. Each role of a, group, of a person in the group is important. But we, I think, today, there is this strong narration that tend to put all the merits on the leader. The, I can do a parallel with meritocracy, but I have no time, maybe in the Q&A. What is my claim? The, the great emphasis our society attributes to leaders and their quality makes them very salient in the followers' eyes. Very salient, very visible, right? The latter, the followers, might not be able to notice that behind every success that is the attainment of the group call, hide the less visible yet crucial group work. This is uh, the, the point that this new amazing uh, ethical, uh, new, mm, sorry, new leadership theories forget. Because they put everything on the leaders. They, cre they make society believe that what we need are leaders, not groups. But instead, and this is our proposal for the 25th hour, what is the message? Rather than looking for new adjectives for leadership, get rid of the noun. Maybe get rid is a bit too strong, right? But at least downplay the role of the, the noun of leadership. How do I imagine uh, a leadership group, uh, course in, uh, for example, a business school? Rather than saying how people can be good leaders, tell to the people who are, or, or rather than forming, educating people for being leaders, call the people who are already in position of leadership and tell them how to do the less possible evil. In, uh, so it's not more about virtues, so e traits of excellence of leaders, but about this course, it should be uh, to help the leaders to recognize all the vices, all the things that they can do wrong. Because this uh, fact that we put all the moral value on the role of the leader creates a lot of frustration also for the followers. Because the followers, he's who one person, by definition, is not a leader, is something less. Is something less. It's, so for me, leadership, these new leadership theories today are a new form of ine uh, ideology that legitimates a kind of inequality. The, the division between the leader and the follower, and it's still hierarchical, even if it should be horizontal. So what is our proposal for the 25th hour, the message? Normativity is back. The ideal workplace, but in every group, is that of a community of people where everyone plays their part in a cooperative game. In this team, everyone follows everyone else in reciprocity in the equal dignity of different tasks. If at a certain point someone has to perform coordinating, governing and accountability functions, because it can be, they will simply do it, be doing their job as I do mine. They will not have to lead anyone, they will not have to influence anyone, they will only have to play their necessary part in the one collective game and endeavor. So for me, this is uh, the narration uh, that should be, you know, proposed today rather than the focus on the leaders. I, I mean, if you have ever been, again, in an organization, you know that the group goal, even without, with the la without the last wheel of the chariot, the chariot will go, not go anywhere. So why today we put all our admiration, value, and even more of positive judgment to leader? We should, do, we should eliminate the distinction between leaders and followers and respect in group the fact that there are people that simply are doing their job, even if they are in position in which they have to govern or coordinate. And that moment in which they govern and coordinate, that moment does not make them leaders. They are simply doing their job as other people who are doing something else, maybe more focused, are doing also their job. 
So this is my message for the 25th hour. Stop putting all this emphasis on leadership and put the emphasis back on the group. And now in the last three minutes, as uh, you remember my friends and girlfriend advice is, has to be about real life, let me introduce you my co-author, Luigino Bruni. Now Luigino Bruni, he, he has been my supervisor when I did my PhD in Rome. And uh, before joining the PhD, I never met him. Um, but when I met him, that is the kind of person that you can easily imagine as a leader. Because he's really in that social group of academics. He's great. He's a, a, an economist who is very good in philosophy, very good in theology, very good in social sciences. He's creative. But he's also a kind person, kind of caring in our relation. And he's very funny, much funnier than me. No, no, that's true. So for me, that kind of relationship could have been easily that kind of relation between a leader and a follower. And in these uh, eight years since I first joined my PhD, we published together nine articles, and now we are working also on these on leadership. But what he taught me, and what this is also the real life, when we were writing the first article together, he told me, Paolo, if I don't give a contribution to that article, I will not put my name on it. And this is it in Italy, something very uncommon, because usually professors try to put their name, you know, even if they don't. So what, is, uh, the, what I learned from Bruni is that our endeavor in uh, writing papers, in doing research, is uh, a collective job. It's not that he's Batman and I am Robin. Sometimes he gave the ideas for the paper and I made more the work of writing it or structuring. Sometimes it's the other way around. At the beginning, uh, in the first paper, you can imagine that his role was more prominent. But in the end, what we did together was also something together for a common goal. So also when uh, others saw that I was publishing with my supervisor, and they were saying, ah, so, so, so you are a follower of Bruni. That was something that could have made me suffer if I took it, because it's, you know, it's kind of, oh, so you are like, you know, the, the person who follows the supervisor. But thanks to him, thanks to the fact that he doesn't want to be recognized as a leader, I understood that this message that in groups, each role, the, the equal dignity of different tasks is very important. And it's the same when I teach. I mean, you know that here I see a lot of my students. My classes without you would not make sense. I mean, I have the tendency of doing the one-man show, I know. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, I mean, for the collective goal of the teaching to be rich, we are all equally important. And th that, in the end, this is not a captatio benevolence and me trying to get your favor, it's, it's real. I mean, without your role there, that endeavor will fail. So it's not that I am the leader, right, as he is the leader. I mean, it's an equal dignity of different tasks. And so, yeah, this is my message for the 25th hour as a, a song from an Italian singer. In this world of heroes, no one wants to be Robin, but I think that we need more Robin and we need to praise more Robin. And thank you for your attention, really. <laughs> Now let's go to drink. No, there's a Q and A. No, we're not going to drinks yet. Try. First, you have to be subjected to the Q and A. So, is there anyone who might have a question for Paolo? Well, immediately. Thank you for breaking the ice. Yes, thank you for the for the talk. Yeah, I was I was wondering from my own experience from part-time jobs, mostly no full-time jobs. Um, often there is a Batman, a leader, pretending to also be a Robin. So the Batman is, is telling me like, oh, but you know, don't see me as your boss, don't see me as your leader, see me as your friend, your family. But I've noticed for myself that once my fellow Robin, who's secretly a Batman, um, is telling me things like one hour before I start my shift, like, oh, I'm sorry, we actually don't need your time. I cannot get mad because it's very difficult to get mad at a friend or yes. sometimes they even call it a family member. So do you think that there's because I really like the, the idea of the, the, the equal workplace and not the hierarchical structure. But do you think that there's also a risk of 
perhaps not call it a new form of oppression when the leader starts to present themselves as also being part of the group. Yeah, but, but this is not, so thank you first because your first uh, person experience is very valuable, right? And uh, what is my point? That in that situation, your leader there mm -hmm. is uh, perfectly aligning with these new leadership theories, uh, a servant leadership, like if he needs to be at your save, needs to become your friend, to sincerely care about it, that is, is okay, right? I mean, I can believe that some people really care about it's nothing wrong. But what should really change is the social perception that in what you are doing with him, you are doing something that will benefit both of you. So that person uh, uh, trying to become your friend, you give me the impression that he's trying even more to control you because you cannot get mad with that person because it's kind of friendly, but he's still is the one who decides, it's not you yeah. who decides. You see the point? So, I mean, my point is stop calling him a leader. If, maybe he's a person who is in charge and is a governing and coordinator, but, uh, and coordinating. But what he, he read or she, is a he, is a, who is this person? Uh, different, experience. different experience. So I would say that this person needs to recognize in you is not someone who is behind. Because without you, the collective goal cannot be reached. Yeah. That's the point. So th according to me, you should not pretend him to give you equal dignity. He, sh he let's say there's any, he should recognize your role that is important, mm -hmm. you know? So this, uh, this is a way to look at the society, but also specifically the market, as a co collective endeavor for mutual advantage. In the papers we, that I wrote with Bruni, sometimes, for example, in this paper on leadership, he had the first intuition, okay, on the, I, I mean, I saw all those books, then I spoke with him, and he had the first, you know, things, and so let's say that he did the 60% of the job, something that maybe I should have not mentioned now, take all the glory for me, but exactly because I'm not, I don't want to be a leader, I mean, it's kind of, or admired, not in this case at least, I'm saying that there, what gives me dignity is the fact that I did the 40%. And without your 40% and my 40%, that collective goal cannot be reached. So, I mean, these leaders that try to mask themselves as Robin, which is something very interesting, something to do, for me, they are still trying to, you know, to control you even more, mm -hmm. you know. So, for me, the, all these uh, moral speech around the role in organization uh, is problematic. Because there you have a role, I have a role, it's different. Maybe I'll do a bit more than you, maybe you'll do a bit more than me. But without us, a world with all leaders will achieve nothing. A war, because this bus these uh, courses of leadership make us think that in the future we can all be leaders, right? And we can all learn to follow. But this is not how the work will go. We always need a group of people working in the equal dignity of different tasks. But yes, I mean, the point is that some leaders mask themselves as Robin. Yeah, you know. th yeah thank you. I, I don't even think that it is a conscious decision to present themselves as, as a friend and then secretly being an evil controlling leader. I think they, they generally oh, want be. to consider themselves as a friend. Yeah, but ah, yeah then the, the risk still remains. Yeah, but, but, but that, is, uh, you know, that is also something a bit different because is uh, when personal relationships enters in the workplace. That I think is also a slightly different topic. Yeah. And on that you can see uh, positive sides because you can have truly sincere friendship even in a work relationship. I mean, with, with many of my students, if they are students, I am the teacher and I'm giving a lecture because also I get paid, I have still sincere friends, I'm a, a, a good, I am fr their friend, I mean, at least from my side, right? And vice versa. But what I'm trying to say here is that there are also bad sides when too much, too many, too much the personal enters in the workplace. So think about in Italy, we have mafia. Mafia is exactly when personal relationships enters in the workplace, all the mafia business. I am not free to choose the person with whom I am trading because I am forced by a personal relationship that I'm not even free to choose to, to trade with someone. So, I mean, it is connected to leader followers, but it's also about, I think, a more problematic issue of personal relationships in the workplace. But thank you. Thank you.
Um, I wanted to make a comment about this new uh, era of leadership, and like, I like for example, I had a personal discussion with my boyfriend, and he very embarrassed uh, tell, told me, "I want to be a follower. I like to be told what I have to do, and I like to follow rules. I'd like to be. I don't want to be this new leader. I don't want to be this new in amazing person who gives orders. I want to know what to do, what to do, and I realized that." We are told from a small ki uh, children to uh, be leaders, to aspire for more, to be the best, to be on the top of the uh, of the scale, blah 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 blah, and which is quite uh, toxic in some sense. At the same time, I was wondering if this is, if you have uh, research on it, if you ha this is a phenomenon you, you saw universally, or it's mostly in the Western countries with in, in the industrialized and individualistic or also existing in collectivistic cultures? Th thank you for the question because it's very pertinent and I apologize because I, I see that in some quotes I made universalistic play we are post-patriarchal uh, post-modern people but that it was to give the impression uh, this research that we have been doing uh, still doing is based mostly on the Western society so US uh, Europe and uh, and individualism can be a, a factor but what you, sp I think, uh, the, the interesting point you raised with the example of your boyfriend is that that is a reaction, right? I mean, it's a reaction in which you find this wave that tells you that you need to be the best, the leader, not only the first. B because what is leadership in the end? Leadership is uh, something to morally legitimize a social distinction between people, between leaders and followers. It's a bit like meritocracy. M meritocracy is, uh, has this function of saying that there are the few meritorious that are worthy to be there at the top and the many non-meritorious that deserve to be, right? But what is the problem? What is one of the fear that I have also in these courses of leadership? The kind of people that go there, that want to become a leader. I can really believe that many of them this is just speculation, that many of them have sincere motivation to really care about the group, uh, but many of them are interested in rational deference. This is what these theories do not notice. I mean, you can put the best adjective uh, on leadership, but there is an issue of power and control there. And power, being uh, the leader, gives you something like uh, that people observe you and like you. Uh, and that. And so, what in economics this phenomenon is called, there is a phenomenon of adverse selection, that this business school, that, or this uh, course of leadership in many business schools and in other places, that would like to attract the compassionate, the ethical, the moral leader, they attract the opposite. They attract the person who is, wants to be a leader just because, you know, he wants to be recognized. But yes, I think that in the, the individualistic society, this phenomenon is even more, more relevant, yeah. <laughs> I'm able to answer, not answering, but that's it. So you, you talk a lot about the, um, <laughs> you talk about a lot about the, like the difference in democracy versus uh, like a, a capitalistic or, or just the general organization. And that immediately reminded me of unionizing and collective bargaining. Do you think that um, the idea of a union, so making the, the collective goal of a company no longer the profit of the shareholders, but rather the interests of the employees, does this, can this go too far? Can this become a distinction between the, the group and the elites in a sense that it ends up severing these social ties in, uh, in a negative way? Or is it uh, generally should go further as it can uh, kind of integrate everyone into this uh, collective culture. What do you think about this? So this is a, an interesting question. Um, so w what is the point? If I can, can, can I go back to my slides? Here, what I said um, in this point, new leaders are disinterested. I say they focus on the good of the group and of the good of the group is to, so, to achieve, which is supposedly good for the group as well. So, as you said, many times in organization, these leaders, manager, they make the group perform, but maybe for the interest of shareholders. And that interest maybe also benefit that group. 
but mostly, I mean, we cannot hide that we, we live in a world for profit, okay? Regarding the unions, there the issue is a bit more, uh, again, I don't know if it's about leaders and followers, but more about in-group, out-group, right? Which group are you part of? You know, are you part of the group of the, of the workers? But that, that can, uh, I mean, that, that separates, I think, too much, you know, the, who is ruling the business and who is, is working in the business. You know, for me, what would be good, for example, is to have uh, union representatives or maybe worker representative in the, in the, the board as it happens in many, in many companies already, okay? So I think that um, the point there is uh, if you mark too much, I mean, that you ask yourself, I am a member of this company or I am a member of this union, right? You, so you have the double uh, identity somehow, right? And that can create conflict. Uh, am I wrong? What do you think? It makes plenty of sense to me, yeah. Yeah, 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 no. So, so I don't know, I mean, I need to think about it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not able to give answer like, uh, but uh, yeah, maybe you wanna add something? That that um, no, I, 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 uh, I'm still developing my thoughts on this too, but uh, of course you're the, you're the experienced one here, so I didn't yeah, wanna yeah, give too true. much of my yeah, That's time, true, yeah, 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 that's true. But anyway, but thank you, but, uh, but maybe let's get in touch after, <laughs> so when I have an, uh, but this is honesty, right? I mean, I cannot pretend that I know everything and just, you know, but that's. Hi, uh, Hi. thank you so much for your presentation. It was really lovely. Um, something that really kind of made me think was about how a lot of the issue with leadership and these roles and let's say disguising yourself as Batman or a lot of this is just um, this is how a lot of societal structures or organizations are structured, where there is a mandate for a certain role of leadership or a certain hierarchical structure that is so intrinsic to organizations that it cannot be changed. Uh, what is really interesting to me or like something I'd like to know is um, when you talk about your proposal for the 25th hour, right? Uh, when we talk about decision making, how does decision making uh, in such crucial factors work within a system that is a lot more horizontal or without a sense of leadership and where would that come from or what sort of process would that follow? So this is an excellent question, uh, as also yours, uh, it was just <laughs> all were excellent questions. What is my point? My proposal, our proposal for the 25th hour is not to say that we need to have a group in which everyone has the equal dignity of equal task. In a group, in certain business decisions, you need to have one person that takes responsibility, that you can hold accountable, right, for certain decisions, that needs to direct the group somewhere. What I really am fighting here is all the moral qualities that we attribute to this person. Because the role of this person uh, in the decision making, even if it's bigger, does not make him some, someone more necessary than the others. That's my point. So these new leadership theories, you know why I don't like it? Because they do this scheme of thinking. They say, oh, you need to learn to listen to the people of your group. You need to be uh, attentive, uh, caring. Uh, but in the end, uh, is th these things overshadow that is the person who decides. So it's good if there is a more participative uh, process when possible, right? My point here is that we should stop to put all this moral value and superpowers on this person, right? Because this person uh, is not the most necessary to reach in the group call. Everyone in a group is necessary. Even if you are, I am making decision and you are not, uh, without you, I cannot reach that goal. So why you should put on me all these uh, values, right? All these, uh, and again, now we are generalizing. Because, but there are some business decisions that actually really require one person that is in charge or that has a vision uh, or that. Uh, so I'm not saying that we can collectively, you know, always take decisions. But, but from this, there is a, a, a gray zone from this to the fact that saying that there is this person who is, you know, our leader, our transformational leaders, as they call it. And in politics, you can also make the parallel in politics. In representative democracy, in the end, is the 
the, le the, the politician, the agent who makes the decision. But who has really the powers is us. I mean, this is at least the, 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 the political system in which we live. I, I like it personally, but I mean, say, no, it's true. I mean, it's not that the people that you are going to vote for tomorrow, they are the leaders, they are in charge, and they hold the power, and they are the source of the power. The source of the power is the people who vote. So, and we have a lot of mechanism, you know, to check this. So, for example, your, your point can, in politics, can bring us more from representative democracy, which the decision making is really up to one few people, to a more uh, deliberative democracy process. But again, it depends on the context. Uh, I have a bit of experience in business and business organization. And there, sometimes you need one person to be in charge. So I'm not saying that you need to always have the perfect, but it's the equal dignity of different tasks that really interests me. I mean, that the dignity of, that even if you are the person who decides and is accountable for that decision for the group, still without the group, you cannot, you cannot arrive to the goal that you set for yourself. So the group has dignity. So you can call it a coordinator, you can call it a, um, a director, you can call it, but still, if you call it as we do now, and this is, believe me, is a tendency, a leader, with all these uh, moral attributes that we put, with this area of divinity that we put on this period, this is very dangerous. It's very dangerous because really overshadows the fact that even if that person makes the decision, those decisions will not be effective without the group. That's the point. And the group is necessary. Having a leader, we claim in the paper, does not make our choices less hard. You need always the group. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Too many questions. I mean. <laughs> so you're advocating for equal dignity, right? Yes. Are you also advocating for equal pay? Oh. That's a tough question. I'm advocating for equal pay. <laughs> That's another of the questions I need to think about. As a first reaction, I would say not, not necessarily, but even if I, uh, I did my PhD in economics, and as I told to my students yesterday in political philosophy, economists are very interested in poverty, how to relieve people from poverty, but not in inequalities. So I'm not interested in equal pay because people have different, but when the inequality became too much in the pay, that is the problem, where the schisser becomes too much. And these leadership theories, the fact that you arrive in a firm after having done a, a course on moral leadership in the best business school, uh, in, I don't know, in, in the United States, that will make your pay much higher for something that you, do, let's say, do you not deserve? Can we say that? So, I mean, again, not equal pay because it's the equal dignity of different tasks, but at least our society, in the recognition of social role, uh, there we need really to have equality. Because everyone is necessary. You know this better than me. I mean, you, you are an expert in organization. And, I mean, a group, uh, we, we, a group of just leaders will not go anywhere. Will not, no, it will not go anywhere. I mean, that, that's the point. Okay. We have uh, the last question. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Which one of you wants to must? No, 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 I'm kidding. We can do more questions. No, she's, ki she's not kidding. Last question. I do. I'm not in charge. I'm not the leader of this. Uh, <laughs> no, that's fine. That's okay. Uh, well, I think one possible motive behind this theory is that, like, we perceive normal workers as lazy. Like, we, ne we need a leader to push these normal workers to do more work. Like, um, like I'm from East Asia, so like in Japan, like there are many people who die because, because of overload working. Like this is also the case in Korea and in China. So like I came to Europe and then find, oh, these people, uh, these people are lazy assholes. <laughs> like, so we need, so one, po I, I'm just stating uh, my, my conjecture that we need leadership because we need to push these workers to do more work, to do more jobs. Like yes, but what you don't need is to call this person a leader. That's my point. In the sense that 
this person, let's suppose that we are all lazy, which I don't believe, by the way, but that's okay. Let's suppose that we are all lazy. And we have this person motivating us, right? Say, do your job, like, you know, kind of, let's achieve the group goal. But this person, first of all, is not, has not specific moral qualities that make he, him or her subject of my admiration. Because in the end, uh, if we reach the goal, it's beneficial also for him. It's not that he's, di he's disinterested, he gets paid more, right? And most importantly, this person, uh, when he's in this position of power and you recognize him as a, as a leader, this person, there is a, a risk of a perverse trap in which this person, even if the workers are not lazy, push the workers to get admiration. Because the, if we continue with this narrative of the leaders, and we form a society full of people who want to be leaders, uh, we need to stick also with the narrative that workers are always lazy, right? Which again, I, I'm not sure it is. So, so the, the leader, one of the things of the leader is that one, when he's in charge, let's say that he's a, when he's in charge, he wants to stay in charge, he likes it. I mean, I, people like admiration. People like to be recognized as, you know. So in my, po my point is, let's say that are all lazy, the worker. Well, that person who is motivating them is necessary for the final goal as they are necessary. So the, the respect that we show to that person should not be major than the respect that we show to all uh, the person of that group, of the people of that group. That is my point. With these new leadership theories, we are centering all the attention and even moral evaluation just on the person. And we ignore that that person, even if he's the best motivator ever, it, that person is not enough to arrive to the goal without the other people that are working with him. That is my point, okay? So I will stop calling it a leader, especially here in Western societies when now, when you say leadership today means this. Make the, make the experiment, go to, to some course. Of, I have LinkedIn, right? If you want, we can become friends, but that's okay. So now, sorry. <laughs> I have link on LinkedIn, you find a lot of these posts with the quotes for inspirational leaders, right? I mean, uh, every time I wake up, I see the, I, oh my God, I say, well, what, you know, be a leader, listening your follower, motivating the elicit the action. I mean, this is really a tendency. It's not something that uh, is my worry. Okay, but good point. Yeah. And now it's done, right? <laughs> Thank you.